I'm Peggy Peck in New Orleans at the American Stroke Association. Coffee and alcohol, after dinner drink, or stroke treatment, or both. Dr. Cheryl Martin Schild reported at, here at this meeting that there may in fact be a role for an investigational agent called caffeinol, which combines coffee and alcohol. Dr. Martin Schild, can you describe your study to us? Well, we treated patients that presented within three hours of onset with TPA, followed by a two-hour infusion of caffeinol at a dose that is about five to seven cups of coffee and about two shots of liquor. Uh, this medication went over in over about two hours um, to patients that had moderate to severe strokes that we had evidence, at least clinically, that the cortex of the brain was affected. That's the outer portion that had been shown in animal studies to respond to caffeinol. And we looked at these patients in terms of their baseline characteristics. And what we, we found is that these patients had pretty severe strokes with a, a median uh, stroke scale, which is a, a scale of stroke severity of 18. And we compared these patients to patients that we had been treating in our institution within three hours of symptom onset with intravenous TPA that would have met eligibility for the study based on the severity of their strokes. Um, and a cortical involvement. And when we compared these two groups of patients, they did have some important baseline differences. The group that had the TPA followed by caffeinol had higher glucose levels, which should predict a worse outcome, and had, high, had higher stroke severity scores of 18 compared to 13 in the group that got TPA alone. And again, that should have weighted against the group that got the caffeinol if there is no benefit. And what we saw is that 60% of the patients, by the time they were discharged from the hospital, had a, a modified Rankin scale, which is a scale of functional uh, limitations of zero to one, which means no, no disability. They may or may not still have some symptoms, but there's no disability. And we compared that to our patients that had received intravenous TPA alone, and we had a rate of about 26% that had a modified Rankin scale of zero to one. And now I understand you're going forward with a phase three trial? In our pl uh, planned phase three trial, we will allow patients that have met inclusion criteria for TPA to be treated with TPA. And then if they agree to participate in the study, they'll be randomized to receive either caffeinol, uh, hypothermia, or the combination of caffeinol and hypothermia, which at least in our animal studies has shown the most robust neuroprotection. Dr. Jeffrey Shaver, you, you served as a discussant for this paper. I'm wondering if you can put this into some clinical context for us. Sure. Well, I think this is a very exciting and very preliminary report. Uh, Caffeinol is a neuroprotective class of therapy. It allows nerve cells to tolerate low blood flow longer. And so it makes a nice complementary strategy to a reperfusion therapy, uh, TPA, or other recanalization techniques. Uh, this was a small and not internally controlled, not a randomized trial. So any observations, the promising observations coming out of it need to be taken as hypothesis generating. Uh, but the careful development program that's been put in the caffeinol, the attempt to design a neuroprotective intervention that will be uniquely powerful before going on to the definitive trial um, is, is really a different approach and a promising uh, approach uh, for the success of this therapy. Thank you. And just one other thing. Um, in previous trials, and I may be mistaken about this, but neuroprotection has been looked on as something that might extend the three-hour treatment window. But just to be clear, your, in your study, what your, your planned study, you would stay within that three-hour um, TPA window. Is that correct? In this study, we would include patients that got standard of care intravenous TPA followed by the caffeinol. Um, if we see a signal of efficacy, it could be tried at longer time windows, but we're not at that stage yet. Dr. Saver, um, earlier studies with neuroprotective agents have suggested that they might extend the therapeutic window for reperfusion study. I'm wondering if you can address that issue. Yes, it's hard to do a study uh, in which you give a drug before TPA because as soon as the patient arrives at the hospital, you run around like crazy getting the TPA started. Um, so most of the neuroprotective studies that have been done in tandem with TPA have been turning to the consent process right after TPA is done. Uh, we're doing a study giving a neuroprotective agent in the ambulance before arrival 
Um, and that's one way that you can do a study of a neuroprotective agent first. Uh, we all anticipate that if these agents work in actual practice, uh, they'll be able to be given uh, even faster than the TPA, often before the CAT scan, you need one before you can safely give TPA, uh, and that they'll therefore uh, eventually have uh, an effect of preserving more brain to be delivered into the hands of TPA. Thank you, Dr. Martin Scheld. Thank you, Dr. Saver. I'm Peggy Peck, MedPage Today.